Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hi, how are you, my friends? Good, how are you? I'm well. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, too. <laughs> Excited to, to have you on here. And, Excited uh, to, to be on. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm adjusting my camera, too. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for uh, episode 35 of Thinking of Art, where today we're going to talk to Leon Benderman, who's the VP of Modern and Contemporary Art at Heritage Auctions. Uh, we're going to talk about like, kind of the history of art a little bit, his background, and some of these incredible pieces that are uh, coming up for sale at their June 18th auction. So with that, Leon, thank you for joining. Um, great to see your face. Happy you're well. And uh, can you share a little bit about your background and how you got into the art business? Sure, sure. Well, uh, firstly, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be able to do this. This is fun. Um, sure. Yeah, so my background, I mean, I, I basically grew up in an art family. Um, my father uh, immigrated to America in his 20s, and his first job was as a framer. So I grew up uh, in a framing factory, looking at art, seeing art. Um, and over some time, he realized that the things he was framing were more valuable than the frames. And, and he, made, <laughs> he made the switch from framing to fine art. Um, so I'd really been exposed to art my whole life. I, I come from a family where my mom had a gallery. My dad has a gallery now. And um, I have three younger siblings, and they all work in the art world in some capacity. So um, needless to say, we roll deep. And then I've, I've got an aunt who has an art gallery and an <laughs> uncle who's still... Um, a big framer in New York uh, called Skyframe. So, you know, between all of us, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a family business. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. Uh, we yeah. had Alex actually on an IG Live recently to talk yeah. about um, his work and, and your family's gallery there. So um, can we jump into the current state of the market right now? What are your thoughts sure. on um, kind of where we've been, where are things going? especially over the last, you know, three months with COVID and everything. What are your thoughts on the blue chip? Yeah, market? it's been interesting. It's, it's interesting times. I mean, I think for most of us in the art world, we expected it to reflect or to be um, reminiscent of what happened in 2009 crash and in the 2001 crash. And, you know, even though I wasn't around, I've studied what happened in, in you know, 1989 and 1990 mm -hmm. to the art market. So I think there was this expectation that we would um, we'd see things catch up uh, a little bit later. There's usually a lag in the art world, um, mm -hmm. which, frankly, I'm still expecting to see. I'm expecting to see prices go down in six months to a year. Um, but for right now, the market has been incredibly strong, much to our surprise. I think unlike other crashes in the past, that really affected single sectors or segments of the market. Um, because this has been so universal, we expected it to catch up to us a bit quicker. Um, yeah. But with that said, our auctions have never been stronger, um, which is, is weird and almost bizarre. Um, but we also haven't had a major market test for six figure and seven figure works. So, you know, uh, based on what I, I know is going on in the private sale market, from what I hear from dealers out there, um, collectors and gallerists, I can say that um, it seems like things that, you know, million and up or half a million and up are not really trading as easily and not really trading as well. Um, but it mm -hmm. does seem like things under a hundred thousand dollars are actually doing better than they did before COVID, which is kind of wild. Makes sense. That actually yeah. makes sense to me. Um, I mean, I think the stock market has been pretty stable, but I mean, real estate market is kind of in flux right now and more flat in some areas or decreasing. So, People putting money yeah. into art obviously makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Can we talk about this upcoming auction that you have sure, and some yeah. of the pieces? I mean, um, the Sam Gilliam, I'm going to talk about that one first and kind of the, you know, obviously like for, for black artists, you know, we know Basquiat is a big name that's, it's driven, sure. you know, his prices have, have obviously risen considerably but can you talk about uh sam's work and kind of some of those artists that are you know of color or um you know sure. from that perspective because you know yeah. we've seen strong results for some major artists that are you know like Liechtenstein and you know other artists sure. that are that are white artists and i think i want to address because especially of everything that's been happening recently um mm. this is a really important topic to talk about 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I also kind of just to address the auction as a starting point, you know, the, um, the auction is June 18th. Uh, it takes place both live and online out of our Dallas sales mm -hmm. location. We normally have the sale in LA, but, you know, due to COVID, we've had to move it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we do have a really interesting mix of works um, in the sale. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, diversity, a lot of minorities represented, uh, a lot of all mm -hmm. artists of color, um, you know, uh, also, you know, different orientation. So, you know, we, we really have a very diverse sale. Uh, I'd say Sam Gilliam is really, in terms of the, the black community um, as an artist, he's, 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 I'd say, very different um, in the sense that you know, Gilliam is an artist who is working in uh, what's called the Washington Color School um, and really working on a lot of color theory. Um, but he's not necessarily talking about anything that's uh, um, about being black or the black experience in America. Um, and okay. I think that's kind of what distinguishes him. You know, his, his works um, really are presented side by side with some of his contemporaries that are white. Um, or from other, you know, uh, backgrounds. And so I, I don't think that that's necessarily something that um, specifically relates. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we do have a lot of other artists um, that we sell on a pretty regular basis, a lot of whom are getting really noticed through, you know, what's going on right now. Um, you know, the ones that come to mind are like Hank Willis Thomas, um, you know, whose who's sculpture in Brooklyn has really, you know, been kind of like a, a, a great meeting point for a lot of the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, as a result of, you know, uh, Gilliam's work, I think he really kind of paved the way for a lot of young Black artists to have gallery representation and to be respected within the field. However, um, you know, in terms of um his work actually talking about specifically about um you know black identity in america i think it does that uh, just a little bit less although it's it's definitely still very important and open the doors for artists um you know that are, are really discussing that now um so we happen to have two works by him in this upcoming auction um one is a larger work on paper and the other is a smaller one and they're both really just fantastic, really beautiful compositions. And his market has kind of really had this huge renaissance um, since a lot of people have kind of taken notice after he's, you know, he's been working for the better part of 40 years now or even more, 60 years. <clears throat> and he's finally starting to have his due. So really happy to be able to present works by him. But we, we sell Gilliam on a very regular basis. That's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that kind of historical sure. background as well. Um, the Thibaut, can we talk about that piece from 1961? Yes. It's a beautiful yes. Wayne Thibaut. Yeah, so it's, it's a fantastic painting. I'm actually going to see if I can get up on my screen so people can see a quick visual, if that's okay. Sure. But, um, you know, this Wayne Thibaut painting is just, it's everything that you would really want from a Thibaut. Um, it's incredibly important because it is from 1961. So for those who are not as well-versed, um, with art history, and, and this is a, a really great little snapshot of it there. You can see, um, you know, but, you know, Thibaut was really an important American, uh, excuse me, um, really important American uh, pop artist, and he really became part of the pop scene in 1961, so the very year that okay. this painting was created. Um, and as a result of that, this was actually included in one of the first major pop art shows, American pop art shows, at the Pasadena Muse Art Museum in 1962. Um, mm -hmm. So what makes that really just so incredibly important is the fact that you know, he's being placed alongside Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein, but he's, he's that kind of West Coast representation. And so he really is the pioneer of the San Francisco Bay School. Um, and so this, this canvas has just got really a, a, a very nice kind of composition. You can kind of see the uneaten hamburger, um, you know, the ketchup, the, the heaping pile of fries, and then the orange drink. Um, so all of these kind of food items, these food objects being the things that Thibaut would become known for later on. Um, and so, you know, these are, these are, yeah. And, and, you know, so these are all kind of present in the work. And what I also love about this work is the provenance. It's only really only changed. It's, it's basically been in the same private collection um, for the last 60 years. Uh, you know, so it really hasn't changed hands uh, many times. It was, 
basically went from the artist to to the gallery and then sold to to this private collection and has been passed on by descent so it's kind of really got almost everything that you want um and you know it's really frankly qu quite conservative at 1.2 to 1.8 million and the bid is currently at 600,000 so it's it's really a, a fantastic fantastic composition i'd say okay love his work can we jump yeah. on to the the keith herring from uh, sure. 1983 yeah, absolutely. So um, love this work. Keith Haring, um, as you know, uh, many people know, uh, kind of like the bastion of American pop art. art um, just an incredibly well known, incredibly important artist. Um, and he really is almost a patron saint of graffiti art or uh, street art. Yes. Um, you know, m you know, many, many people uh, think of a lot of different things when it comes to herring but I think really the the kind of usual number one thing is his subway drawing series so getting out into the public and using the public sphere using the public space uh, space as his um, as his canvas and so this is a really interesting work because it's made on plexiglass so it's a different okay. medium which I always like I always enjoy when artists are using different mediums so these are these are uh, this is a work on red plexiglass and you can kind of see that um, you know, the, there's kind of almost no front or back to the image because his imagery is so kind of universal and it's also mm -hmm. kind of um, so identifiable. It works backwards, it works forwards. You can flip it, you can, you can see it on either, on either side. Um, and it just has everything you would want. It's got the radiant baby, it's got the television screens, it's got, um, you know, some of the cosmic rays and the, the UFOs. Dog. Yeah. The barking dog. I mean, so there's really, you know, almost everything that you could possibly want in a um, in a herring composition is going to be, you know, uh, is is right here. And it also has a very interesting provenance. It was a, it was originally um, um, acquisitioned, I'd say, by a friend and dealers um, of of herring uh, and he basically commissioned this and three and excuse me, two other works. Um, so we're really happy to be able to sell one of these three. Um, and that was, sorry, that was Lucio Emilio, the, uh, the, the dealer. And then basically okay. it, it passed from, from Emilio through Martos Gallery to a private collection. Uh, Martos Gallery bring, you know, the preeminent uh, Keith Aaron Gallery uh, basically over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, made its way to, uh, to, to us here at auction. So we're just really excited to be able to offer this work. Um, you know, and I think the timing is, is also you know, really important, I think, aside from what's going on with Black Lives Matter, I, you know, even I, I really do identify and associate uh, Herring with um, a lot of ideas of public protest, a lot of ideas of getting messages out to the public and, and art being a yeah. universal concept, um, but also being timed uh, with Pride Month, you know, so that kind of uh, works out as well. So, uh, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was nice to be able to offer a really fantastic Herring composition. What's the estimate on this one? Uh, this is 500,000 to 700,000. Um, I believe the last kind of uh, comp sold for about 1.2 million. So we have some really high hopes for this one. Okay. Might be some yeah. more is there. Um, yeah, hopefully. Okay. okay, the Frankenthaler from 1991, the Leprechaun piece. Yeah, so this is a, a really beautiful composition and Frankenthaler is just, you know, uh, Frankenthaler is timeless and, and classic. Um, but what makes this composition very interesting is really the fact that she made this work much later in Can her career. Can you show yeah, a picture? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. So um, I'm just bringing it up on my screen here. So as you can see, this is the composition. It's just a really beautiful composition. Um, and, and part of what I like about this composition is because it was made in 1992, Frankenthaler had already basically lived her life. She had already had um, her kind of really um, important strides in terms of being well known in the marketplace, in terms of having, um, you know, received a lot of critical acclaim and success. And as a result of that, you know, she's already kind of come into her own. And, and even more importantly is she's gone through the 60s where she got acclaim and then the 70s and 80s. Um, and now in the 90s, she's already looking at a new generation of artists who are incorporating her ideas and her work and so she's already seeing it come full circle. And so mm -hmm. for a canvas like this, for Leprechaun, you know, you can kind of see that almost that, that, that maturity. You can see that change, you know, where she used to be working with staining the canvases and really making 
um, you know, the paint, uh, thinning it with turpentine and making it part of the composition um, and not having the paint rest on the surface, but really staining the canvas itself. I mean, here mm -hmm. you can see the little, there, there's more gesture, there's more um, kind of playful brush strokes. You can see the, the red up here in this corner and then the areas of orange here, and then this kind of overall bioluminescence of the green. It's just, it's a really beautiful composition. Um, beautiful. And you know, it, it's, it's a great size too. You know, I'd say it's, a, it's 35 by 58, which I, I think is quite large. And especially for Thick. a Frankenthaler is, is very manageable. Um, yeah. And similarly, this is also, this work was made in 1991, it was sold in 1992, and it's been in the same collection ever since. So it's almost 30 years that it hasn't seen, um, you know, public view. So it's just, it's a really fantastic, fantastic work. Okay, and what's the estimate on that one? Um, so the estimate here is 300,000 to 500,000, um, which again, I think, you know, when you compare that to other Frankenthaler works is, is incredibly reasonable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, can we jump to the Liechtenstein? Absolutely, yeah. So this is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, so this is this is kind of For a fun the one. Woman um, fans out there. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to bring up the image here. So this is Reflections on Minerva. Um, it's from 1990, um, and and this is a little bit different, um, just because we we typically don't actually offer prints in our um, modern and contemporary art sales. We usually have a dedicated print sale. Um, but, you yeah. know, this is also a, a kind of factor of COVID. So this was slated for our print sale. And unfortunately, due to, you know, logistics and issues related, you know, around that, um, we, we're, we're selling it now in our modern contemporary art sale. Um, and this is just, it's, it's another great composition, you know, especially for an artist like Liechtenstein, where paintings are in the millions and in the stratosphere and, you know, people can't really easily access them. Um, these are, you know, items that, you know, the prints are much more accessible. You can get a really iconic, really well-known image, um, you know, and not have to, you know, invest millions and millions of dollars. Um, this is really nice because it's from a smaller edition size. It's from the edition of 68. Um, and uh, it comes from the Reflections series. So they're just, you know, Lichtenstein was incredibly interested in the idea of reflections in artwork um, both reflecting uh, the character, but also reflecting yourself in the work and being able to see yourself in the work. Um, so he was very mm -hmm. interested by that idea. And he worked with Tyler Graphics um, in upstate New York, in Mount Kisco, to, to really perfect a lot of these compositions by using things like metallized PVC collage, um, embossing, screen print, screen print relief, um, lithograph. So all of these prints are really, they're so masterfully made um, they all really um, incorporate multiple um, printmaking processes into one composition. So it's, it's really just a, a, a great image and, and uh, again, very accessible. And, and it's huge at 42 by 52 um, for a Liechtenstein yeah. print. It's quite large. What's the estimate on this one? Um, the <laughs> estimate on this work is 50 to 70, and the bid is currently at, at, at 35,000. So it's okay. already been, up, been bid up to 35. Okay. And can we talk a little bit about the fees and how that works for, for people sure. that may not have fought, you know, at auction before? I want to do a little mini sure. tutorial here just for future reference. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are a number of fees at auction. Um, uh, basically, the way it works is when you're bidding at auction, uh, the number that most people pay attention to is the hammer price. So the hammer price is the, the price that, or the number that the auctioneer is calling out. Um, and then wherever the hammer falls, wherever the gavel lands, there is an additional what's called a buyer's premium. So that is basically an added fee that is added on that the buyer is responsible for. Um, it typically has nothing to do with the seller at all, but it's really just attributed to the buyer. Um, and that fee can range. So it can range depending on the category. Um, and it can also range depending on the value of the object. So for example, at Heritage and most other uh, major auction houses, uh, up to half a million dollars, the, um, the seller's commission, excuse me, the buyer's premium is gonna be 25%. Um, then aside from that, you'll have the fees that you'd have with any other object that you buy anywhere else in the world. So uh, you might have sales tax if uh, it's applicable, depending on what state you're in and also what state the work is being sold in. Um, and then the other thing that you may or may not have is 
a shipping cost, a crating cost, a um, insurance cost uh, for transit, those kinds of things. So again, it's something you would incur with any other purchase. So really the only big thing to keep in mind is the buyer's premium. By adding 25%, that's obviously a material difference in terms of the value of the work. So just as an example, if the hammer is 100,000, you're paying 125,000 um, and then plus any taxes or, or shipping and or shipping, any other you know. insurance. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to go over that. Yeah, and then of for people to, to buy online, like how, have you seen like a spike in people registering online through COVID? Sure. Before, yeah. You know, before and during COVID, I'm sure you have, but. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because we were very well suited and we're well placed for COVID um, because we were the mm -hmm. first auction house to do auctions online. Um, a lot of the auction bidding technology that you see out there in the world, um, we actually invented. All of our auction bidding software is proprietary. So um, we own uh, basically everything that we use for our, our bidding systems as opposed to others that license them. Um, mm -hmm. So you. for us, we already had something like 96 or 97 percent of our bids coming in through an online channel. Um, you know, we still do phone bids and we still have people come in the room, but 96 to 97 percent of our bids were coming in online. Um, and in the time of COVID, that went from 97 to 99. Um, so basically, yeah. it, it's gone up 2 percent. Um, but yeah, we, we also and one of the other things that we do that's really very helpful is we also list all of our auctions with third party platforms. So that includes our websites like Artsy, Artnet, um, live auctioneers. So, you know, we make sure that kind of anyone who could want to know about an artwork out there knows about the artwork um, and knows where to find it and when to bid on it and how to bid on it. Um, but I will say that we have seen a huge spike um, in traffic. We've also seen a huge spike in um, you know, page views, number of registered bidders, number of bids being placed. Um, and we think that all of that really has to do with the fact that people are at home bored and they have nothing else to yeah. do. So they're bidding. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Have you also seen a spike in consignments for future sales? Unfortunately, no. I mean, with the prices being as strong as they are and the bidding being as strong as it's been, um, it's actually been very frustrating that we haven't found many consigners um, although I will say in the last month now, things have really ticked up. The traffic has gotten back to kind of where it was pre-COVID. But, you know, mm -hmm. for almost a two-month period of time, we really weren't getting many consignment requests in. And it was just such a shame because, you know, the things that would have came in two months ago are being sold today. Um, and, and right now the prices are just, you know, really very strong in the marketplace. Um, but with that said, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of um, consignments come in now. Are there sectors in the blue chip market that you feel like there's some opportunities for collectors? Um, out there? Uh, you know, I think, you know, frankly, right now, um, I do think that the, the opportunities are going to be coming soon. Um, I don't think that they're happening today just yet. Um, mm -hmm. We feel like in six months to a year, those opportunities will be there. Okay. Yeah. More in like the million million dollar and higher prices. Or pieces? Well, the, the problem with the million dollar and higher prices is always going to be getting the sellers to, to let go of the work. So a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, especially affluent art collectors, they're very wealthy. They don't necessarily need to sell. Um, yeah. So on the rare occasion that you find someone who needs to sell, then, you know, they'll be letting go of a work for less than it. Um, then they might have to. But, you know, for the most part, you'll find that on the million dollar and up works, you know, people are only, you know, are, are usually really holding on um, for, mm -hmm. for, you know, for their collections for as long as needed um, until prices kind of recover. So, you know, I think we will see some opportunities out there. But, you know, really, I think the bigger opportunities are going to be in the, the sub million dollar range. Um, and th that I think those works are going to start to come up more and more in about six months. Can we talk a little bit about male and female artists in general? Sure. Just, you know, like how, how the pricing, uh, pricing has, is different between male and female artists. I think that that topic is also yeah. something that somebody yeah. wrote to me and wanted, wanted me to ask you about. So. Of course. Well, you know, I, unfortunately, I will say that, you know, um, the art world in general has not done a good job of, uh, you know, proper representation for artists. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, across uh, gender diversity, you know, 
um, orientation, you know, almost any kind of, kind of major category you can think of. I think 75% of the work being sold is by white males. And, um, you know, that's, uh, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I do think that there's been a shift in the, you know, in the last couple of years, we're definitely seeing more artists of color come in. Um, and I think prior to that, there was a small shift where we were seeing kind of a reassessment of a lot of female artists. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, I'd say on the on the whole, the art world doesn't do a great job of, um, you know, of, of creating that diversity that it, it needs in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, the bigger question is just how that's going to change over time. I think most galleries and rosters now are much more um, aware of um you know the lack and the the necessity to 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 be more even handed um and, and to present work from you know a variety that said you know i think that that process takes time um yeah. you know that entire process takes time so you know between galleries starting to show um more diverse um artists and artworks you know, till those get bought up by museums and institutions, till those start to get bought up by collectors, you know, you're looking at a time span that can sometimes take decades, um, if not, you know, definitely years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I definitely agree with you. The awareness is there more yeah. than ever, which is great. Oh, um, definitely more, more, more awareness now than five years ago. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, what about the, the Louise Nevelson? Um, the release, Louise Nevelson is just really fantastic. I mean, the, the kind of big draw on this work is that it comes from the Snyderman collection, um, which is just a really fantastic collection that we're... Um, so the, the Nevelson comes from the, uh, the Louise Snyderman collection, um, which we're, we're just really happy to be able to, to present and to be able to sell. Um, mm -hmm. And this work is, is a za one of the Zags. Uh, moon, uh, moon, this is Moon Zag number three from 1979. So really what you have um, you know, with, with this work is just this incredibly intricate construction. Um, she's using both found objects and machine-made objects. She's incorporating them into this incredibly detailed work. Um, I'm just trying to pull an image up for you, but unfortunately it looks like I'm having some trouble doing so, but let me see if That's I can okay. give you there's that. Um, oh, so yeah. there, that, there it is. So you can see the zag there and you could just see like kind of the, the complexities and the kind of intricacies in this, in the composition, you know, each, each yeah. one of those little areas being really almost like a, um, a small window into another world. You know, her works are obviously always kind of thinking about talking and discussing, um, you know, architectural ideas, but also, you know, by painting all of her works black, you know, that kind of removal of color, um, you know, and, and she's known for most of her compositions being entirely black. Um, you know, she's really mm -hmm. forcing you to kind of be, look at the object and, and be present with the object as opposed to, you know, looking at, um, you know, the kind of color palette. I mean, she did make several works in white, but, you know, really she's most known for these, for these works that have, are completely devoid of color. And, you know, this, this moon zag is, is from 1979. And, um, you know, just knowing about the collection and knowing about the family, they really collected the best of the best out there. Um, you know, they had the means and they were, you know, they had the, the kind of um, patronage to be able to buy works directly from gallery, uh, galleries at the time. And so similarly to some of the other works we've looked at, I believe this work was acquired in 1980 and has not left the family since. So um, it's really just, okay. you know, it's just really another, another, you know, great thing to be able to offer something that is just so fresh to the marketplace. Um, so what's that's what's really, the estimate on that one? Um, I am going to tell you, the estimate is 80 to 120,000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's just another really great composition um, that we have available. What do you think about mm. you know, the future of art fairs? I mean, we're at 30 minutes right now. I want to spend a little bit more time yeah. with you, but sure, what sure. are your thoughts on, you know, the art fairs and, you know, I, obviously I've seen you at many art fairs for many years and sure. out and about and life is different now. So what are you hearing? Yeah, from, I think the art fairs, fairs yeah, you know, it, well, Art Basel just got announced. That Maybe um, I'm losing. I, oh, can you can you hear me no now? Worries. 
Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, great. My apologies. Sorry about that. So, um, no yeah, you know, I think our, our Basel in, in, in Switzerland just got canceled. Um, so that was kind of a huge blow. They had originally postponed it from June to September, and now it's been canceled in total. You know, I think the way that the world does business is going to change. And obviously that pertains to the art world too. I think, you know, uh, fairs are going to be less frequent. Um, I think they'll be smaller. Um, and I think that they'll, they'll have kind of a rise to the top where really only the best fairs are going to remain, remain um, yeah. you know, uh, very relevant. But I also think that it might be an opportunity for some smaller cities and some smaller fairs out there to also have, um, you know, to also have their, their kind of moment, because I think people are, are going to be less inclined to go to big cities with big fairs, and they might be more inclined to go to smaller cities with smaller fairs and to really have an opportunity to connect with the artists, to connect with the galleries, um, and an opportunity to, to be in a city maybe that they wouldn't normally get to, you know, to go to. Um, I just think, you know, places like New York and, and London and, you know, some of the cities that have been really hard hit by by coronavirus are probably going to take a while to bounce back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah I, yeah, I hear you. Okay, that's good. Is there anything else that you're hearing that would be, you know, a good educational kind of uh, advice, maybe for collectors out there, whether they want to buy online or whether they want to buy at a gallery or, or from sure. the artist directly that you can share with us? Yeah, well, I think, you know, look, COVID has given a lot of people a lot of opportunities to learn how to collect art differently. And I think that's really the, the kind of silver lining here. Um, it's certainly been difficult for a lot of people. But by the same token, I would say that it's given people an opportunity to learn about transparency, transparency and pricing. Um, you know, we, for example, are an auction house, so we list all of our estimates. But we also mm -hmm. list all of our reserves, you know, and we list the current bid so that you know exactly what's going on. Um, so, you know, I think that people have appreciated that. I think if you look at what galleries have been doing online, you'll see that most galleries are posting prices now. And I think that that's incredibly interesting. That's a huge shift and a huge change. You know, five years ago or even one year ago, galleries would tell you, yeah. no, no, I can't post prices online. And now mm -hmm. they're doing that. Um, and I think that they're realizing that that's in increasing activity and increasing the number of sales. Um, the other big thing is, is being able to create systems that allow you to be able to, to do sales without necessarily um, having to see the work in person. So that includes things like working on shipping practices, um, also working on, um, you know, on condition reports, high resolution images, um, mm -hmm. giving people the opportunity to have an inspection period like of, of two or three days or even a week. Yeah. Um, you know, all of those things, I think, are, are great advantages that are coming from um, the, the, the changes that we've had to make as a result of COVID. And, you know, I really do think that, that those things are for the better because that's just going to allow the art world to grow and the number of sales to proliferate and for us to have those systems in place, um, I think is just going to, uh, it's going to aid the marketplace in general. Yeah, absolutely. It creates a more, a more efficient system. A hundred percent. Well, my friend, we are out of time, unfortunately, but I, appreciate I really that. appreciate Thank you, Captain. Of course. I really appreciate you taking time today and uh, good luck with the sale. And thank you. Um, yeah, if there's anything else that we want to talk about in the future, I would love to have you back on. Maybe there's another sale or uh, another topic. Same here. But you have same here. Just really... such a wealth of knowledge, and I really appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you, and I've enjoyed you doing it so much. A lot of fun. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. I'll post this to my IGTV right now so you can watch it. Um, it'll be archived there right now. Thank you, Leon. Great. Thank you. All Bye. Right.